Hey friends, before we get going with today's episode, I want to talk about my other job as a church leader for a moment. Look, we've all worked really hard this past year and burnout is real. That's why I'm excited that my friend Chris at Delmar has released a new program called Rethinking Evangelism. Now, you probably don't know my friend Chris, but he has been a marketing master for 15 years. Now he wants to help churches learn the same digital skills he has been teaching companies that whole time. Rethinking Evangelism is a revolutionary program that will give your church the tools and training you need to finally enter the 21st century. I'm talking about running digital ads to let people know, I don't know, that your church exists or building an email list to stay connected with the people who do visit you. You'll learn how these tools can help your church grow. And hey, if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that digital skills are life skills for churches. If you'd like to get the ball rolling and have a conversation about how your church can learn these new skills and join Rethinking Evangelism, then just go visit RethinkingEvangelism.co today. That's RethinkingEvangelism.co. is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. All right. Welcome to the Adventist History Podcast, everybody. Matthew is here in the house with your August bonus episode. Can you believe that summer is almost over here in the Northern Hemisphere? Well, I am wrapping up a crazy tour of duty to end the summer. That uh, It saw me traveling maybe three out of the last four weeks for... For two of those weeks, I was working 16 hours a day, which uh, which was insane. And uh, anyways, happy that that part is over. The best part about it, though, best part about it being over is that I'm scheduled to do some research at the General Conference in a few weeks, so I am super stoked about that. going to be spending a few days there in near-perfect solitude, taking notes on hundreds of pages of documents, and that's just kind of my jam, y'all. Not exactly a vacation, I mean, because research is exhausting. But it's the kind of work that fills me up. Do you know what I mean? Some work is hard work. It's difficult work. It's straining work. But it's work that fills you up. And so maybe I'll tell you some more about it in the September bonus episode. We'll see. For this bonus episode, however, we're going to be talking about James Lamar McElhaney. We've been talking about him a lot in our main episodes for reasons I don't I don't really don't quite understand because I don't find him to be a a particularly uh, like compelling individual. I don't see his articles in the review and I'm like, man, I want to learn at this guy's feet. Um, no, no offense meant to him, but uh, he's just he just is always there. He's just kind of a quiet guy in our story, but he's he's always there. I think he is the most consequential general conference president since Arthur Daniels, which, you know, I don't know if that sounds like a bold claim to you or not, but when you think about it, I mean, McElhaney wrapped up the Depression years. He navigated the church through World War II. He brought regional conferences to black Adventists, and he did this and more in 12 years in office, which was nearly as much time as his two predecessors had combined. So he had a lot more time to work with, and life gave him some difficult situations that he he managed, I think, well. You know, the Depression and the World War, the, the racial friction in the church, he, he handled them well. So, you know, just handling that stuff well, I guess, is going to going to put you down as a pretty competent leader. I don't think, however, that he was some visionary once in a generation kind of leader. I just, I think he was competent at the job. And can I just say that that's okay? It's just okay to be competent at your job. Like we don't all have to be insert famous, innovative person here, right? The guy who revolutionizes the industry. Like it's okay to not be flashy. It's just okay to be good at your job. Now, we know McElhaney didn't particularly love being the general conference president. And maybe that's what made him decent at it, right? Um, he just showed up for work, he got it done, and he went home. But uh, anyways, he was he was consequential. The, the things, the decisions that he made ha- had great ramifications for the church. 
going forward. So anyways, I don't know why I find him so interesting. I, I, I just, I really don't. His career is rather strange. He doesn't strike me as a particularly interesting thinker, as I said. Wasn't a particularly exceptional evangelist or pastor. If he had never become general conference president, I'm not sure many of us would find his life interesting. Daniels and Spicer are perhaps easier individuals to understand. Daniels was a consummate leader, was politically gifted. Spicer was uh, a, a, just very different from Daniels in some ways. He was a very spiritual person. Uh, but these are the kind of people you look at when you're younger, and, and you, you see a young Daniels maybe and a young Spicer maybe, and you say, these people are going places. Would you say the same about a young McElhaney? <clears throat> maybe. He was a conservative Adventist man in a church full of conservative Adventist men. But those conservative men who did well in a presidency were those who nevertheless possessed a certain broadness of mind that appeared when needed, people who could break with tradition when necessary. So McElhaney was no dreamer. He was no idealist. But he had that, that mental dexterity. I don't think he was a civil rights activist, okay, by any stretch of that <laughs> definition. But when it came time to listen to the Committee of Black Adventists who were asking for his attention, he did. Now, as we learned, he did it on his own terms, didn't he? He effectively resisted pressure from the committee to collaborate with them and give them regular updates, right? They were, they were pressing him, if you remember from those episodes, they were pressing him, you know, hey, they wanted to hold his feet to the fire. Make sure you follow through. Don't just make empty promises to us. What are you doing now? You know, are you getting ready for this? Explain your process. And he's just like, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to have any of this. I'm going to do it my way. And he, he did end up doing it. He got it done. E.D. Dick, who worked with uh, McElhaney for many years, called him conservative but courageous, which I think is close enough to how I feel about him. The guy was not um, just, uh, he's, he's not the leader of your dreams. But, but when moments came that required him to be better, he was. And I think that's okay. That's okay. Now, this isn't a long episode necessarily. Um, I certainly didn't start out. <laughs> to, I thought, oh, good, this is going to be a really short one, you know, so we can, we, can, uh, <laughs> we can just do this episode and move on. What I realized was that wasn't necessarily true because every time I sit down to write something, it always ends up being much longer than I thought it was going to be. So, yay, there's that, right? But what I think it is also is this is a uh, an incomplete episode in some respects. It's not a um, comprehensive view of of James McElhaney. Okay, it's not a this dude is you know here's everything you need to know about his life. It's not really like that at all. It's it's more of a a skeleton. Yeah. It's more of a skeleton. Now, what I mean by that is I'm not putting the, the muscle and the skin on this guy. I, I've not gone through all his letters and articles and found out what other people said about him. And, and you know, doing the kind of research you would do if you're going to do a biography about a guy, that's not this. I, I basically just kind of glanced through his life. I just assembled the basic structure of it. If you're going to write a biography about somebody, of course, one of your first tasks is to assemble a, a working timeline of their life, of their life, uh, where they worked, when significant events in their life happened. Okay. You build that skeleton. And then from there, you dive into these specific moments and just flesh them out a little bit, put some muscle on there, put some fat on there, put some blood in there, uh, and, and just really make them human. And you present them as a human to the reader. I, I'm not going that far. Okay. I'm just, I'm just doing the skeleton here. If you want to take it further, and study the guy you can, but this is this is the skeleton for you. So just pretend we're all sitting in the classroom right now, and I got the skeleton on a stick, and uh, and this is McElhaney. This is a, a a sketch of his life. This is the rough outline of his life. He's obviously more than this, but he's certainly not less than this. So that's uh, that's what we're gonna be doing right now. It's kind of like just to switch from metaphors. It's kind of like turning the oven light on and watching the bread rise. So you know that's what we're gonna be doing. We're going to be just watching the bread rise here. So pull up a chair. Let's start this thing together. Now, one of the things that strikes me about McElhaney is his deep faith in Adventism. We talked in the last main episode about how McElhaney saw his boyhood days 
as a time of great piety and faith in the soon return of Jesus. He spoke of, of sitting at the feet of pioneers like Ellen White as they preached the good old truths of Adventism. And he lamented how, by the 1940s, that sense of solemnity had given way to some kind of accommodation to this world. People are not always very specific about this, these, these charges of worldliness, right? We've, we've become too much like the world. And people will say amen to that without really knowing, well, what exactly do you mean? <laughs> Is it because I, you know... I hummed a secular tune. Is it because I'm I'm wearing uh, the latest style of suit? You know, what exactly does that mean? We don't want it necessarily defined. <laughs> we're scared when people define it. But we're saying amen to like, don't be worldly, okay? We'll agree with that. And and, and so he saw the church is, is becoming more worldly, at least in comparison to how he remembered his childhood. And it was the mission of his presidency to recapture, to really to recapture his childhood for the church. Um. Now, looking at his childhood, it's it's not hard to understand why he felt that way. McElhaney was born in 1880, which was a few years before Jones and Wagner started making trouble for the old guard Adventists in California. In fact, McElhaney was born just down the coast in Santa Maria, which is an awesome name for for, the, for a city where the general where a general conference president is going to be born. He was baptized at 15 years old while Ellen White was in Australia. And he finished his education at Healdsburg College. He, he began at a public school, but finished his education at Healdsburg College, which is now Pacific Union College, uh, about the same time that Ellen White made her home nearby at Elmshaven. So he no doubt heard her speak a number of times, but it's important to understand that, that he was coming of age at a moment when the legend of Ellen White was at its peak. McElhaney grew up with the legend. That's the Ellen White he knew, okay? She was larger than life as she was finishing her life's work. This wasn't the insecure girl who got hit in the face with a rock and who was, was struggling with, with her calling, uh, with her confidence in her calling. This wasn't the woman who was sharing a stage with two men who were more prominent than her. She had overcome the stubbornness of Butler and Smith and returned from her wilderness in Australia. And most of the Adventists alive at the turn of the of the century hadn't been present when she would go in the vision in the middle of the room necessarily. That that history was sacred now. She was older than, than many Adventists. That's not to say that everyone believed in Ellen White's prophetic gift. I'm sure there, there, there have always been Adventists who didn't, okay? What I mean is that she was now beyond question. She was an institution in Adventism. She'd been around since the beginning, the beginning that most Adventists weren't around for. Um and, and so she was at the height of this um, this celebrity, I guess you could say. And I'm not saying Ellen White cultivated it. I'm not saying she wanted it. I'm not saying whatever. But but we know that there was this myth of Ellen White that began forming in the later years of her life, and it just kept snowballing in the decades ahead. And this was the Ellen White, the institutional Ellen White, the mythic Ellen White, the the iconic Ellen White, that the, the legendary Ellen White that McElhaney was growing up with. Okay. Now, even Kellogg, the only man, or the man, the only man, I should say, of stature who conceivably could have challenged her in these years, just, I mean, even there were lines that even he wouldn't cross with her. He didn't dare to publicly doubt her visions, right? When the whole controversy with him erupted. Now, he undermined them in private correspondence and things like that, said she was mistaken, said she had bad information, all that kind of stuff. But even he didn't go out and say, Ellen White's a phony, trust in me. He couldn't attack her head on and and hope to win. He just couldn't. And in the end, he didn't he didn't win anyway in terms of uh battling for influence or control in the Adventist church. Didn't win anyway. No one no one can stand up to her. And so this is the Ellen White that McElhaney grew up with. Now McElhaney moved down to Los Angeles after he graduated from college. He attended a camp meeting in Los Angeles where Ellen White preached, and the members at this camp meeting part of the California Conference, immediately voted to form a new conference, the Southern California Conference. It's a long drive, guys, from north to south in California. And that same camp meeting voted to form, the, the that same camp meeting also voted to give McElhaney ministerial credentials. He'd begun as a Bible worker, call porter, and they, want, they gave him ministerial credentials. So a new conference gets formed. Ellen White is there. She's present. And he begins his pastoral career. All right, so this is a really important thing, I think, in his life. 
uh, at the nexus of the founding of his career in the establishment of a new conference was Ellen White. All these three things are together for him as he's beginning his career. And, and while she wasn't personally responsible for either, it's a good omen, right? I mean, how, how great it is to be a pastor and say Ellen White was there when I first became a pastor. She was preaching when that conference was formed, and I was there, and, and you know, all of these, these situations together, even if they are independent, it's, it's kind of they, they have the glow of her presence. It's a good thing. You know, in later generations and later decades, you can be like, yeah, Ellen White was there when I, when I was first uh, voted to be a pastor. So even though she didn't have any say in, the, in, the, in who got to become a pastor and all that kind of stuff, it just it felt good, right? Because, you know, gosh, if I wasn't supposed to become a pastor, surely Ellen White would have said something, right? So just her silence or her presence just implicitly kind of endorses this, this course my life has gone on. Um, and, you know, he was the last of the bridge generation of Adventists. If Uriah Smith and John Loughborough were pioneering generations, then people like Arthur Daniels and James McElhaney were the bridges that connected the pioneers to more recent generations. Those Adventist boys and girls serving in World War II had never met Ellen White, of course, but there were plenty of people around who had. And so in that way, they still had personal access to her. Right? I, I remember asking my grandfather about his service in World War II. Um, that was really neat to hear those him tell those stories of his service. But, you know, the World War II generation is is sadly just about gone. Um, I think the World War I generation is definitely gone. I thought there was a few hangers on. Uh, but we're losing access to to the people who had primary experiences during that conflict. And so, you know, I guess you could consider it like I didn't talk to him extensively, but I, I would be a bridge generation. So my kids are going to learn about World War II by me telling my grandfather stories to them. Does that make sense? So McElhaney and, and Daniels are bridge generations on the on the one bank of the river. They had firsthand experience with the pioneer. On the other bank of the river, they are communicating those experiences to people who didn't have firsthand experience with the pioneers, okay? So I bring that up because uh, I think understanding that McElhaney was among the last of the bridges to have any prolonged contact with her or some of the other pioneers uh, was probably influential with him. I mean, do you think that knowledge that you're the last of a generation who remembers something really important means something? Don't you think it'd give you a burden to share that information with people to make sure those experiences just don't go down with you? All right, I'm, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze McElhaney. I'll leave that to Steve Daly. I am just trying to understand how he saw the world, particularly as it relates to those good old Adventist doctrines and Ellen White. I just want to get into his shoes and, and imagine what it's like to have memories of Ellen White when I was young and how impactful that must have been and and then you're you're looking around seeing a bunch of young Adventists who who have never met her, um, who don't have as much attachment to her, and you're like, hey, this person, these people, this generation, this pioneering generation is really important, guys. We don't want to lose the lessons uh, that they taught us. And so you you know I can understand how McElhaney would have a, a great deal of reverence and affection for her. But there's one other thing, and this thing will take a little bit longer to talk about. One other thing that strikes me about McElhaney's life. And that is how improbable it seems to me that he should ever become a general conference president. His career <laughs> followed a really strange trajectory here, guys. He didn't start out at Healdsburg College, right? He started out public school and switched to an Adventist school at the last minute. He just happened to be down in L.A. when the new Southern California Conference was formed as one of its first pastors. He was a single pastor, I should add, which was no doubt a barrier to his career prospects. He did get married in 1902 to to Cora Ackerman, and only then was he given a ministerial license a few weeks after the wedding. So, you know, mazel tov, buddy. The next year, the General Conference asked him to go to Australia. Now, this was a weird situation, guys. Like, why did the General Conference call McElhaney to Australia? He wasn't ordained yet. He had, he had been pastoring for less than two years. He had been married for one year. He was in a brand new conference, and the GC not only took McElhaney, but another Southern California conference pastor as well and shipped them off. Why? Why him? Even today, it is not common for a pastor to switch conferences before they are ordained. So why McElhaney? 
Well, it seems that he must have caught the eye of a patron. That's my working theory. And that patron is uh, George Irwin, president of the Australasian Union. Now, Irwin was also chair of the Committee on the Distribution of Labor, which is to say Irwin led the committee that recommended that McElhaney be sent to the union that Irwin was president of. Still, though, the question is why? Whatever the reason, McElhaney arrived on August 7th in Sydney with the other new recruits and whisked off to meet the, me the members in that area. Now, McElhaney began doing evangelism with a tent and was ordained, finally, in 1904, about, uh, about three years or so after he started pastoring. So let me lay this out for you because I, I just I find this interesting. I may be the only one, okay? I may be, may be the only one, but I find this interesting. 1901. He graduates and starts pastoring in a brand new conference. 1902, he gets married and gets licensed. 1903, he gets sent to Australia to do evangelism. 1904, he is ordained. Again, even today, guys, that's fairly speedy as far as ordinations go. I mean, I'd say that pastors, uh, you know, aren't ordained within three years most of the time. Most of the time, it's a, maybe a year, two, three years after that. Uh, at least not that I've seen. Now, once again, Irwin was involved. He's, he was involved in McElhaney's ordination. I don't know what McElhaney did or said to impress Irwin, but it seems to have put him on the fast track. He, he found himself a patron. Okay, so maybe finding a patron in the church is, who will put you on the fast track isn't weird or surprising at all. If you want to be general conference president, it's almost a requirement, guys, because you know the ladder to the top, starting out as a pastor in a local church, getting all the way to the top of the GC is so long. It's such a long climb that you have to skip a few rungs somewhere if you have any hope of getting to the president's chair. Though I'm not sure McElhaney ever hoped to get there. Okay, I'm not trying to paint him as being a really ambitious person. Uh, you know, by some accounts, contemporary accounts, he wasn't particularly politically adept or interested. Uh, it just so happened. All right. And, and at this stage in life, he's probably just enjoying the ride. But what happened next was definitely interesting, though, if not, you know, more unusual. And it involves the Philippines. The only reason why the Philippines were on the church's radar at this point is that a particular church administrator had visited there while en route to a GC session in America. This administrator spent eight days there to see if the nation might be ready for some Adventist missionaries. Turns out he believed that they were ready for some Adventist missionaries, and he strongly urged the GC to send workers without delay. Okay. First worker was a coal porter named R.A. Caldwell, and he was sent to plant some seeds. He was the first missionary to the Philippines, although if you really want to, you know, read the footnotes, I could add that Abram LaRue sent some literature to the Philippines when he was in Hong Kong, but he never set foot there. So anyways, a coal porter was not enough, apparently. A minister would have to be sent to follow up and form a church, and that's how McElhaney got the nod to go. Oh, and that church administrator who spent eight days there to determine whether a missionary should be sent to the Philippines? Yeah, that was G.A. Irwin. So, you, know, you not only took a newly, newly wed newbie pastor and shipped him overseas to Australia before he was ordained, but then, after a little over two years in Australia, you ship him to the Philippines to be the first ministerial missionary there? Guys, McElhaney has only pastored for five years at this point and has only been ordained for a little bit over one of those years. And he's pastored in two countries already. He served as an evangelist and a missionary as well. That is a lot to throw at a new pastor. And just between you and me, he didn't exactly shower himself with glory over there, okay? Because the Philippines were still an American territory. McElhaney was told to reach the Americans there first and to plant a church. And the idea was that he would give Adventism a relatively quick toehold in the territory. So McElhaney did reach some Americans, but they soon returned to America. He never actually planted a church. And after two years, his wife, Cora, was sick and they left for New Zealand to, to work over there. And guess what? After two years in New Zealand, Cora was again sick and they returned to the United States. The McElhaney settled in Boulder, Colorado, where James served as a hospital chaplain. Now, it didn't take long for him to take on some more work. He was asked to become the conference religious liberty secretary on August 22nd, and then pastor of the Capitol Hill Church in Denver less than a week later. Less than two weeks after that, 
The General Conference Committee invited him to relocate to Washington, D.C. to serve as a chaplain in the Washington Sanitarium, so he left Boulder on October 2nd. Now, this is... <laughs> the guy only spent two years working in California, three years in Australia, two years in the Philippines, two years in New Zealand, and what, a few months in Colorado? If James Lamar McElhaney was on the path to power in the Adventist Church, you could have fooled me. He was a professional drifter, guys. I mean, he never spent more than two or three years somewhere, sometimes far less. And it, it's not like, man, the guy was baptizing a 1,000 people here and 300 people here and 50 people here. I mean, he didn't. I, I'm not going to judge him for not succeeding in, in the Philippines because I think that's just a really difficult situation. Um, but he only had two years there. I mean, he needs more time to to succeed, right? But he's all, he's just, for whatever reason, maybe he got a call from somewhere. Maybe his wife got sick, right? Both of those things have happened to him. Uh, his calls always kind of get cut short, don't they? He doesn't ever, you know, he, he doesn't seem to stay anywhere long enough to really make a difference. And, and so, you know, he gets called to D.C. And as with so many... Other church administrators throughout the decades, the allure of working in the shadow of Adventism's capital was a career-defining move for the McElhaney's. It wasn't long before he was on the General Conference Committee and became the president of the brand-new and short-lived District of Columbia Conference. That's right. Washington, D.C. had their own conference. Now, you know, he's a conference president at this point, and um, not having—I mean, honestly, how do I put it? He's been pastoring for like nine years, and he's already conference president. Okay, I've been pastoring longer than that. I'm not anywhere near being conference president. The guy just sh shoots up like a rocket, and I don't understand why. Why? Like, what did he do? I don't know. I don't get it. Anyways, you might be surprised to learn that he only stayed in D.C. for three years, but that seemed to have been enough. Because in 1913, he took on the presidency of the Greater New York Conference, where Cora, his wife, headed up the Sabbath School Department. Sabbath School, by the way, was one of the common places in the denomination for women to really exert leadership. Well, and, and she, I guess, did a, a fine job. Now, he only lasted two years in New York. And in 1915, he was president of the California Conference. And he just happened to be there, right? <laughs> he just happened to be there. He, he was only in the job for three years. In, in the California conference, but he just happened to be there when Ellen White died, and he served as a pallbearer at her second funeral service. Okay, so that was from 1915 to 1918. In 1918, he was elected president of the Southeastern California Conference, not Southern, Southeastern. McElhaney began his career in the Southern California Conference, somewhat, it seems, just by being in the right place at the right time. But the conference had grown so tremendously that they had to split it into two. So you have Southern and Southeastern, as well as the uh, back then, the California Conference covering the rest of the state. And just as he, has pi he had pioneered the Southern California Conference as a pastor, he would pioneer the Southeastern California Conference as president. And guess how long that lasted? Two years! It was time for another move up the ladder. In 1920, after 10 years of being conference presidents in, in <laughs> you know, one, two, three or so places uh, where... <laughs> Now he is uh, going to become the president of the Pacific, U uh, excuse me, the Southern Union first in 1920, 1922, the Pacific Union. And he stayed in the Pacific Union for a whopping four years. So good job, buddy. <laughs> you really hung in there for four years in one spot. Amazing. And uh, after four years in the Pacific Union, he moved up to the General Conference as a vice president for North America. And he stayed there for six years, guys, six years. 1932 is when he left and returned to become the president for the second time of the Pacific Union. So fantastic. He spent, you know, by the time he was done with his two stints as president of the Pacific Union, he'd spent like eight years there, which is just incredible. He just had to split it over two different terms, I guess. But of course, his presidency of the Pacific Union didn't last super long because in 1936, he was invited to become president of the General Conference. Not unheard of, unusual for, uh, uh, maybe not even super unusual, but just, you know, not as often 
uh, you have a, uh, a union president becoming the general conference president. Uh, you know, oftentimes you have somebody else who's a little bit higher up. But I guess he was working for the general conference for a while. So he was well known to them and had chaired some GC session meetings before in 1932. So, you know, again, he was selected for that. I mean, just what a journey. Like McElhaney began pastoring when Arthur Daniels began presiding over the General Conference as president, okay? Just use this, this little thought experiment. By the time Daniels left office, his one job as president, by the time Daniels left office, McElhaney had worked for 11 different entities of the church, <laughs> right? When he left the General Conference presidency, uh, and McElhaney did. He was praised by his peers for being a wonderful administrator and, and a compassionate person. But I just, I wonder how how effective can you be leading a conference or a union for these two or three or, you know, rarely four-year stints? Like, how much can you really connect with people and get to know them and eat with them, right, and, and really just begin to serve them? Yeah, especially in an age before cars and, and phones were really widespread. Uh, McElhaney's whole career was blessed in this regard. Irwin helped launch him, giving him opportunity after opportunity, it seems. Others, no doubt, took over from there. And while I'm sure he was a capable pastor, I, I, I just I don't know what in his career merited his rapid rise because he just doesn't seem to have stayed anywhere long enough to make the kind of professional connections one normally makes when they're on the rise through the ranks, okay? In any case, I don't have a neat little conclusion for this episode. I don't have a nice little life lesson to keep in mind. I just thought McElhaney's early exposure to Ellen White and his very strange career arc were both just interesting features of his life, and I, I just wanted to share them with you. Now you know a little bit more about the guy we've been talking about. If I could go back and meet him in 1910, uh, I, I probably never would have guessed that this guy would... would uh, not only be a general conference president someday, but a, a pretty influential one, a pretty consequential one. Again, he's not known for his intellectual contributions to Avenus theology. I don't think he was an innovative evangelist or effective missionary. If something made him really stand out, I don't know what it was. Okay, maybe the Holy Spirit just kind of had a fingerprint on him. I don't know. But I guess here's what I'm going to walk away with. Well, I said there's not a, a neat little lesson, but but here it is. Here's what I'm going to walk away with. You can't, <laughs> you can't always judge a book by its first 80 chapters because sometimes that last chapter in someone's life really surprises you. Yeah. I'll see you guys in a few weeks when we talk about the 1952 Bible Conference. 